And uh, one of the things that we were seeing with customers as we were rolling through was the issue of uh, really taking a look at how different types of auditing impacted customers and then taking a look at our tool set to aid them. And uh, the evolution of where we were at was taking a look at the main product today that we'll talk about, uh, RHN Satellite, um, and uh, how you were able to either correlate some of what the auditor would do in terms of a scan and, and then either try and produce your own reporting or reporting mechanisms to prove that you were in fact compliant and dealing with the issues of backporting and things like that that we'll talk about today and coming up with a real solution to be able to uh, remediate or answer what the auditor had happened. So uh, three years ago we were really trying to roll our own scripts and coming up with Excel spreadsheets and trying to answer questions and uh, down the line we came to find out that really uh, you know 80 to 90 percent of the auditors out there were using some of uh, the commercial products uh, such as uh, Tenable's uh, Nessus security scanner and uh, came to find out that they had that in-house so I began to work with actually working uh, with Nessus uh, last year and uh, really trying to tie in uh, a component of the satellite product which is the API layer and tying that to Nessus because the whole notion was how do we correlate. We'll get into that uh, within the presentation here. Um, so um, I've already made introductions. I'm Akash Hanishkar, I'm a solutions architect. I specifically work on the commercial side work with a lot of uh, customers uh, that really deal with the PCI DSS space. And so a lot of uh, information that you'll be getting from me is coming from a PCI DSS type of a spin because that's the type of work that I deal with. And I'd like to actually go ahead and introduce Lee Kinzer. Uh, yeah, so I do primarily work with uh, the Navy and Marine Corps. So uh, he's kind of got the spin towards PCI. I have the spin towards the STIG policies coming out of DISIC because that's what the, I'm dealing with most of the time. And then uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Jack Daniel. Thank you. Um, I am the, the technical product manager for Tenable Network Security. Um, my primary job is to uh, speak to folks and uh, more importantly, listen to folks about uh, the enterprise solutions that we offer. Um, but Nessus is the key component that the company was built on. Uh, the scanner's been around uh, many years now and it is used by a lot of people and uh, we use that as an integral component of our uh, scanning. And we have been on a crusade to work with uh, companies to integrate so that we can uh, do more with Nessus and with Security Center, but also deliver uh, you know, synergies, or it's, I'm sorry, it's too early in the morning for words like that, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> to uh, mutual benefit of ourselves, our companies, and our mutual customers. And I've got to say, working with Red Hat's been a pleasure because we're, uh, we're doing some cool stuff and there's more to come. Indeed. Okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to give sort of an executive summary of, of you know, auditing as a whole. And this year what we've done is that we've noticed that over the years, uh, customers were really uh, not just interested in PCI DSS, which is the space that I was in, but auditing as a whole. And so what we've done is taking a spin on our slides this time around and really covered um, taking a look at a correlation between all the different types of uh, regulations, if you will, and focusing in on the fact that they all have a common language. That common language is really to be able to control your network and show it and then prove it. And, and that's, that's really the key is being able to have the tools and the tool sets to be able to control things like patching having the repeatable process uh, be put in place for lifecycle management, and then having the reporting functionality to show that you've in fact been able to correlate the data. So that's what we were really after. And I think it took a good, I'd say six months to a year to define this for us, because this was in fact the common problem that we were seeing is not just being able to patch, uh, but the correlation was key. And then once you had the correlation dialed in, well, you need to report it. And the reporting part is where you have to prove this. So uh, I, I think that's pretty accurate from, uh, with regards to what customers have been telling us as well. So um, what I did was uh, instead of watching TV, I, I, I decided to actually take a look at um, the regulations that were out there for PCI DSS, started 
pouring through some of the HIPAA documentation, uh, STIG, uh, and so on and so forth, and started just really correlating the things and commonalities that we saw and aligning them against our product set. So um, it might be a little hard to see just because it's, it's pretty tiny as you explode the, the document up here, but um, the slides will be up on Red Hat's uh, Summit website after the presentation. You can pull this down. And so um, with regards to the actual requirements, what I did was start aligning them to every single one of the product sets that we have. So if you were taking a look at uh, things like how do I have uh, uh, authentication across my network instead of you know, Etsy password files sitting across every single box and you need some sort of common mechanism to, to be able to authenticate, then you know, you'd be taking a look at like identity management or even the directory server pro product to be able to do that. Um, or if you were taking a look at how you would actually uh, harden a box, then you, know, you might be taking a look at SE Linux. So as I started to go through this, um, what I did was I went through more regulations and aligning more product and taking a look at things like Red Hat Certificate Server and you know, how you might be able to do single sign-on authentication, which becomes a requirement for much of the uh, regulatory compliance, and headed off in the area of really this, this space here. Um, because it impacted most of our, cu our customers is, the, is what's known as the scan. Uh, the, the scan really was the deadly conversation with a lot of the customers that we were after. The other stuff you could, you could prove out and, and build into your network and most of the auditors were happy with that. But what about the scan against the machines and how do I prove uh, that in fact I've patched my boxes? And so um, really the focus was in, on that specific requirement which is regulatory test. Um, so uh, with regards to this, uh, really understanding how the ASVs work and uh, taking a look at how uh, the notion of a false positive and a false negative gets put into place. And I'll actually have Jack talk to you about that because uh, Nessus is also uh, a PCI ASV and I think it's interesting to get a third party perspective on how that process works. So uh, the approved scanning vendor, there's the, let's back up just a little bit. So the sure. idea is we want to talk about compliance in general, but we're going to use PCI um, as, a, as a specific example. But a lot of these apply beyond that. But PCI is one that, uh, you know, everybody's in the crosshairs of PCI. So as an approved scanning vendor, uh, we have to uh, provide a service that uh, meets standards. We do test scans until the PCI council is happy with us. Um, the tools themselves are never certified, so if you read the fine print on everybody that does this, it's a service that we offer. We happen to have a hosted version of Nessus called the Perimeter Service. It's the same version of Nessus that you can buy. However, we host it and therefore we know we control the, the uh, policies, same policies you can download, but uh, that lets us scan and that's benchmarked. And uh, the reason they're doing it is they want to make sure that the scanner is tuned properly the policies are locked down and that there's somebody to hold accountable for that, which is why they only do services and not uh, tools. But the same tools are used. And basically, um, there, there are two commercial tools that cover virtually all, well over 90% of the PCI ASV uh, work that's done commercially, Nessus, and then uh, one of our competitors. Um, okay. And so uh, this notion of false positives and false negatives, yes. how, do you, how do you see that, Jack? So there are a couple of things here. This one, uh, particularly with mature Linux distributions, Red Hat being the, the, the mature one that we see continuously in large enterprise, in small enterprise, in the government space, uh, a lot of scanners don't do a great job figuring out the backported patches. You know, you, they, uh, they look for whatever may be running on Fedora, for example, that's got the security patches, but they don't do a good job of saying, oh, you know, the, this version is backported, it's fixed, whatever the bug in Firefox, uh, Apache, whatever, it's been resolved, even though it isn't the latest version or the highest number, let's not say that. Um, and that's a concept that I'm sure all of you can understand innately. You're not, however, auditors that go from site to site every week or every month and um, don't deal with these things. And so that's a problem we see a lot. At Tenable, we make a great deal of effort to make sure we find the correct version number and compare it to what's the latest and most current. Uh, 
However, you know, sometimes you can't get to that information and that, that leads to it if we have to scan externally. Yeah, and on, on that note, one of the things to actually mention is that um, I think most of you are familiar with the whole backporting mechanism that Red Hat uses with regards to packages. And so you have an enterprise package, what happens is that the innovation bits go into it, but what happens is that if we end up finding a bug within the package that we deliver to you or security fix, then we're going to apply it. And then because we have this entire ecosystem upstream, we apply the same fixes upstream so that the next generation of the product also get, gets uh, those specific security fixes. The issue and the problem is, is though, is that the correlation piece, uh, the audits sometimes will fail because they'll tell you like an Apache package is missing XYZ, but they're scanning against the upstream package, not necessarily what's on a Red Hat box. So it becomes incumbent on you at that point then to correlate it by going back on like an RHN satellite box, pulling up the package and pulling up the actual CV information. You can do that two ways. You can either QA it or it's going to be in the spec file and then all the CVE information and the maintainers are, are actually there, right? Uh, but that becomes extremely tedious. And so the idea was then, you know, how do we get to a point of, again, that word is correlation. So let me uh, talk about false positives just a sure. little bit, because every time we talk about false positives, we get into a, a discussion. So this is a little chart I came up with, which is really simple. When we're talking about false positives, uh, we're basically looking for a condition. It, it's either there or it's not, and the tool either discovers it or doesn't. So this could be true for, you know, on your Windows systems, your desktop antivirus. This could be true for, um, you know, web content filtering. This can be true for um, IDS, and this can certainly be true for patch and what we're looking for is um, a true false positive is we're looking for a condition um, that we've uh, missed. So we say the condition doesn't exist in this case. The condition is you need to be running the latest version of whatever, Apache. And the truth is it's a false positive if we say or somebody else says it's not there. The, in the IDS world and antivirus world, there's a whole other column that we put out there which is I don't care. But that doesn't change the truth of true, true and uh, false positives. Um, and that's a whole other discussion, which is why this exists. But the, the reality is that if you get these false positives or false negatives if we're doing security scans and you miss something, it take, it's labor intensive. The idea is that we need to be as accurate as possible and give you the tools to remediate quickly because you don't have enough time. I mean, no matter what topic I'm talking about in technology, I ask people, hey, does everybody have too many intelligent, educated, and hardworking coworkers in your team, right? I've yet to hear, <laughs> so we can't waste your time and, and your teammates and your employees and uh, coworkers' time. So um, the real question then is uh, <clears throat> these high-level questions that are asked uh, from Red Hat to a lot of customers. And these are things that you should keep in mind if you're going through this process of figuring out how to go through an auditing process. And that's really, um, what do you need to do to prepare for the audit? Uh, and then uh, what can you do to really take a look at proving uh, that you've applied the patches regularly? Uh, and then you know, being able to talk about the backporting. So uh, there's not a link here, but one of the things is that, uh, that's highly advisable is actually to go on redhat.com and uh, within the security section, there is an entire definition of how backporting works. Highly advisable that you actually give that to the auditor before you begin the audits, because what it does is define how Red Hat backporting works. Um, just in my own experience working with customers, and uh, they are referenceable. Two years ago, uh, Discount Tire actually went through this process, and that's who I was working with through this whole PCI DSS side. Uh, once we handed the backporting documentation, uh, to them, uh, the process of defining and understanding the actual audit and how we deal with packages became a whole lot easier to explain. So that's definitely somewhere that you want to start. Um, then the next thing you want to do is, uh, within the slides here, is define what your life cycle really uh, means to you. And they're going to check that. And what I mean by that is your process is all the way from development on into production and what you've got in place to be able to prove that you've applied security fixes and patches. And what they're looking for is a, is a word, and that's repeatable. Uh, you have a repeatable mechanism to be able to apply that into the production space. So um, 
What we ended up doing is really taking a look at implementing uh, RHN satellite to take care of the job and uh, really delving into this notion here. And that is uh, having a strategy for being able to take a look at uh, the various types of versions of Red Hat all the way from the updates that you're getting and then defining a mechanism within RHN satellite. So that might be custom channels that you end up creating to put in your specific content and then build in these specific types of security errata. And depending on your patching cycles, that might look like something uh, with regards to putting the RHSA level high security fixes and then figuring out another strategy for being able to take the medium and the low ones and completely eliminating any of the uh, enhancements, so to speak. So that's certainly uh, one uh, idea of how you might be able to do that. And uh, this is a typical whiteboarding experience that we go through with customers on trying to figure out what would be your strategy. Uh, the second one that's worth mentioning is that a lot of customers have gone towards the idea of using the uh, extended update support, uh, the EUS product or the Z stream, and ending up on that. Because we come up with a seven month cycle of coming up with updates and some customers just feel that's a little aggressive. So the Z stream actually extends that another 18 months what happens is that you stay on one stream and we end up just putting in the security fixes and then all the hardware enablement goes into that too. So that strategy has proved to be very effective as well for customers. Um, so uh, then we get to the RHSA levels. So the RHSA security levels are defined uh, by Red Hat in terms of severity, but they're also closely tied to the CV information from MITRE.org. So, uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and tell you the topic in the description, but as you scroll down through the bottom of the page on this, and I don't have all of it, uh, but what it will do is actually link the CVE information uh, that impacts the system. And so, uh, as you can see, I'm trying to build an evolution here. This is what customers would have to do is address the CVE that you might get audited for or they flag, and then have to, have to go all the way down in an RHN satellite box in the past to pull the CVE up, correlate it, print this thing out, or produce your own report, and then give it back to the auditor. A little bit painful, but possible, right? And so the idea then was like, you know, this is good. We could probably do that, and you know, customers are smart enough to utilize the API to connect it up, but really the correlation piece needs to be stronger, hence working with Nessus. Um, so, as you can see, the slide is all about proof, proof, proof. So we were constantly in a state of having to prove that the hosts were indeed scanned properly, then patched, and then obviously uh, coming back with the reporting again. And so um, really, uh, this is a nice, wow, I learned something in school, a Venn diagram, wow. Um, so it was taking a look at the systems that were audited and managed by satellite and then doing the uh, ongoing correlation and figuring out how that scan uh, results would correlate with what it is that they produced. Um, so then, like I said, uh, a lot of work was done on the back ends because the reporting on the front end didn't get the job done. So started focusing in on the API layer and I put this slide up if you're not familiar with how the APIs work in RHN Satellite. But one of the things that you can do is really make an XML RPC call to the back end of satellite, authenticate as a user, and then uh, what, you can do, what you can do is perform queries against it and produce either your custom reports or have an external tool uh, such as Nessus do that for you. So the work that we began last year was to really focus in on this and connect the two pieces together. And so um, really what Nessus is able to do at this point is connect to uh, the API layer of RHN satellite and do the correlation that way. So we want to give you an engineering perspective of how that was done. Okay. And uh, at this point, uh, really taking a look at, uh, hey, RHN satellite, do you manage the actual system? And then if you do, uh, what packages do you have underneath it? And then with those specific packages, starting to do the correlating work of, okay, I see that you have this. I've scanned for a specific type of package. Uh, it's showing me that you need to remediate it. And then going and having the connecting pieces with RHN satellite to potentially push, uh, push the fix back in, right? 
And so last year, and this is worth mentioning, uh, we had done some engineering work where the RHN satellite, or uh, the Nessus tool was capable of actually pushing out the fix. And I looked out into the crowd, and I didn't get happy answers from the fact that, no, we never want our security team pushing out anything to, uh, to our boxes. And so... Uh, yes, <laughs> we, it was... <laughs> we had a lot of capabilities because the, the Nessus API and the, the uh, satellite API are powerful. And I said, hey, look, we can just put a checkbox there and say, would you like to just fix this now? And then common sense prevailed. And it's like, you know, the guy that you let run the scanner may not be the one who should decide if the week before the holidays you should update Apache, uh, you know, <laughs> or whatever else, or less dire. Uh, so, uh, yeah, some comment on that, those few lines of code. Uh, yep, and hence the checkbox was taken <laughs> out, so that doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's, so, it's still easy to do on the satellite side where that decision should be made. <laughs> sure, so um, for people that are still trying to figure out what Nessus is in the crowd or you don't know, I figured that a quick yeah. review of that. So, uh, Nessus is a uh, started life as a vulnerability scanner. It started life as an open source project. Renaud Dryasen, who is one of the co-founders of Tenable, did it. Uh, the first public version of it uh, came out in 1998. He was 17 at the time. Um, I have no idea how many downloads there were of the open source version. As it evolved and needed to grow and grow, we reached a point, or the company reached a point, where it needed a complete rewrite from the ground up. And it was probably the second or third one of those. And he realized that uh, he was the only one contributing code to this other than a little bit of plug-in. So uh, they decided to build a business out of it. And so there are still older versions. Uh, there's, a, there's a fork of the old open source project. But we were able to uh, monetize it and um, also continue to make it available free for home use and whatever. So it, it's moved. And we've got uh, 5 million or so downloads of the commercial version in the past few years. We have about 50,000 plugins, and those are for configuration, for management, for vulnerability detection, for patch detection. And that actually um, hides the number of vulnerabilities that we look for because some of those plugins may have a dozen or more uh, CVEs that they look for. Uh, it is widely used. It is uh, part of our enterprise suite. It's the active scanner used with Security Center, but it's also a standalone tool. Uh, not a sales pitch, but it, it's a tool. You can throw it on your laptop. Wherever you go, you can scan as many machines as you want. Um, it's relatively inexpensive in the space. Uh, it's used by auditors. It's used by penetration testers. It's used by network engineers. It can be you know, how you validate a lot of different things uh, and scan a lot of different things. But one of the things that's always critical is looking for vulnerabilities and patch status. And we can do a couple of things that you mentioned there, remote and local vulnerabilities. And this gets into the, the value of, of satellite beyond the, uh, the obvious, which is uh, scanners originally did external scans. You hit the box from the outside, whatever bounced back, we would make assumptions, or didn't, we would make some assumptions based on that. And that would give us the classic external port scan up to external uh, identification scans, figure out what the OS is, figure out what's running and what versions. Uh, we added in the industry, we added the ability to log into the system because obviously if you log in with root level permissions or administrative permissions on whatever OS, we can actually find out the truth about what's running on that box. And so now we can see not just the banner that comes back from a service that's running, but we can look at the package that's installed or the service that's installed. And um, for those of you in enterprise or in government, you may have discovered this. Sometimes you as the security person or you as the scanner or you as the the Red Hat administrator need information about a different system, and whoever runs that team doesn't just like email you the credentials. It's amazing. I don't know why they don't do that. Um, so sometimes getting the credentials to do those things can be tricky. This is where something like satellite comes in handy. If I can get the credentials to satellite, I can scan a segment of the network that I want to know about my Red Hat enterprise. I want to see what it looks like. Well, let's say some of these are sensitive devices. I can't log in directly. I can get this up-to-date information. And in the case of some of the others that we integrate with, it's, he it's heavily limited. So like Microsoft WSUS, that tells us all OS patches only. In the case of satellite, satellite knows all. Right? Okay. Satellite knows all. So we can do inventory. Uh, and we can also find this patch information. So we get extremely accurate, complete, and concise information without having 
to solve the problem of logging into that box. That box actually might not even be online at the time. Right. Depends on scans. So maybe you're a green shop, all the machines shut down at certain times. Maybe you know they're behind load balances. Who knows why? Maybe you just can't get at some of those machines. We can fill in those blanks. You can just query satellite or you can do a blended version depending on what they can access. So the idea is um, with compliance is you don't want surprises. The less painful this is, the more often you can do it. That way when whoever the auditor is, if it's a P, you know, PCI QSA coming in or whoever it is, maybe it's internal audit, you don't want surprises. So the, uh, the easier this is for you or for whoever's running the scans to get complete, accurate information, solve the problems, then the more likely it is to run these all the time in the surprises. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, products can't be certified, uh, only service providers can be, um, and they, they run you through uh, a lot of hoops, so the PCI Council does in this case. Uh, the way we do it is we give you two scans a quarter if you use our service, that way you have a problem, we don't charge you for the second one, uh, but we give you really detailed reports and work with you to solve those problems. So um, this, uh, this really uh, spoke to where we were about two years ago and um, you know, uh, Cliff Perry who's sitting in the back, who's the product manager uh, engineering, he and I would you know, exchange a lot of uh, phone messages and emails back and forth with the API and you know, trying to figure out everything from creation of uh, PHP pages to going back to the API layer and producing custom reporting and doing the correlation. So um, we had hit a stage then that this was the key. The correlation uh, really is the key to being able to pass the audit. And, um, and I wanted to make a point of it this year because of the fact that um, I probably have more conversations with more customers uh, with respect to, no, no, I've got my satellite server all running. I believe I've got it patched. I even got the errata working. Uh, but I need something as an intermediary to do, help me with the correlation reporting function. So you get to see that today uh, with regards to the demo. And so, um, and then the next part is that, yeah, that's great that I can correlate. Accurate reporting is necessary because the whole notion of the upstream package scan and then the downstream packages that we provide, uh, that seems to be the pain point for a lot of customers there. And again, uh, without you know, taking up too much time, we'll show that in the demo as well. Um, so uh, these are the things that really, to take a look at the audit um, and generalize this amongst the customers, and I have Lee speak about this too in his space, is that uh, they want something that's centrally managed, and in this case, it's origin satellite. The host is up to date. That seems to be huge. And um, the language, I actually had the opportunity to sit through an audit uh, at Discount Tire and walk through that process for about a month, month and a half, just showing up, listening to what the auditors had to say. And that language came up a lot. And so if you're going through this process, they're going to ask you, um, you know, how do you know that your hosts are up to date? And one of the things is obviously you can show that through RHN satellite. Um, there are some neat components that have been built into the product also with regards to being able to query by date and producing CSV files, so on and so forth, that are all scripted out as part of RHN satellite. Uh, but um, they also want to know that you're patching regularly and have a process for that. So I um, told you that I tried to make it shorter this year and not talk my ear off and just show you slides, but we want to get into the demo. And uh, Lee uh, actually started working with me this year, but came at an angle from the government space. So maybe you can talk about some of the issues and the problems that you've seen there and uh, how, how you came about wanting to work on this. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> I worked in the, in the Navy space for about uh, eight and a half years as a government contractor and part of that time as civil service. Uh, most of the work that I did was around security. Uh, we were a computer network defense service provider, so everything that, that we did was under a, a magnifying glass to know exactly what was going on. So it became an issue of constantly having to deal with system scans. And uh, with previous vulnerability assessment tools that I've used, it gets to a point where the number of false positives that you're getting on any report vastly outweigh the number of things that are accurate on the report. So when I heard about the integration between Nessus and Satellite, 
I was pretty excited to see what that looked like. And from, from working with it in the time that I've been working on this project, I've, I've come to learn that they are pretty accurate when it comes to anything that, that you get as a finding on a system. It is almost always true. I mean, we've identified what, maybe two, I think, in the time that we've been working together that, that weren't accurate and were maybe a false positive. Everything else is accurate. It has full knowledge of the Red Hat security advisories that come out. When you see a finding on a system, you can actually go into that, be able to see what RHSA it associates itself with, what CVEs that ties back to, and then links directly out to our stuff so that you can see bugzillas and everything that are associated with it as well. And the good news is, uh, last year, I think around November or so, DISA decided that they were going to move away how many guys in here are public sector defense department? Anyone? Or am I talking to no one here? <laughs> okay, a couple of people. A couple so, of hands. <clears throat> uh, last year, DISA announced that they were going to be moving away from their previous vulnerability scanner and now moving everything over to Nessus. Uh, so when you're looking in a DOD space, for you guys that do work in that sector, uh, pretty soon this is going to be coming down from DISA through their ACAS program to get that deployed out and have everyone running on that. Uh, instead of the, the current vulnerability assessment tool. So right. it's coming right. through. So soon. it's the, it's the uh, enterprise suite, which is security center, so you're not managing individual scanners. It's, uh, but it's Nessus is the engine, and it also includes the passive uh, tool, which is not what we're talking about here, but that's uh, another interesting part of what we do. So, yeah. Gotcha. All right, so anything else? We can go ahead and jump into the demo. Yeah. And before we do that, I just wanted to kind of point out uh, a couple things. One, um, two of the key benefits that I, I want to try and show and display while we're going through the demo, and then also a little bit of, of how the, the lab environment is set up that we're going to be running everything on. Uh, so the first two key points are some of the ones that Jack brought up earlier. Uh, the ability to do scans without having to have credentials on the end system. So we don't have to have a username and password to access a system that maybe the system administrator doesn't want us getting into. Uh, and a side effect of that is that we don't have to log into that box so we don't have to touch that box, meaning it doesn't have to be online. If you're auditing user workstations that might be turned off at night, or if you've got a remote facility that might not be connected whenever you need it to, if you're working in a DOD space like I am, maybe it's on a ship and that ship it has intermittent connectivity and normally you would have to schedule all of this out with whoever that remote facility is to get this done during the time that you need to run your vulnerability assessments. Now that we've got the integration with satellite, the queries come from Nessus directly to the satellite. It gets a full package list of what's on the system, generates the report from that, and you don't have to deal with scheduling all of that out with the other parties. And then we'll talk a little bit about how the lab is set up here. So basically what we have are, are three different laptops uh, running the demo. All of them are running RHEL 6.2. One's dedicated as a Nessus security scanner. One's designated as the uh, satellite server. And then we've got one that's a virtual host that has five different VMs inside of it we're going to be using to mock this up. So we've got two DNS servers, two web servers, and a management workstation uh, that we'll be kind of using and managing inside a satellite and then auditing those systems with the Nessus tool. So with that, let's go ahead and get logged into Nessus. What we'll do first is go ahead and kick off a scan here and then we'll talk about what's making that scan up. So we'll hit launch on that and let it run in the background. So for any scan, the first thing that you have to do before you can actually run it is build a policy that talks about what that scan is actually going to check. So this policy here is pretty generic. The big thing that changed in here is that we've disabled everything in this section under port scanners. So there's no TCP or UDP connections going out to the system that we might have to wait on to time out uh, if we're going to be scanning something that may be offline. That gets into whether or not it's a mixed type of environment or a mixed type of scan or not. You know, if you're going to be doing a network scan like Jack was talking about earlier, you'd obviously have to leave this stuff enabled. But if you're strictly doing a vulnerability assessment on package revision numbers, you can uncheck all of this so that connectivity out to the box actually isn't necessary. One, one note on that. If you're doing this, this type of satellite scan, to think about the impact this has on your network. So if you do credentialed scans, it's a lot lighter than doing a non-credentialed scan hammering away from the outside because we just have to throw a ton of traffic. Credentialed scans are a lot lighter. If we come back one more step, and instead of asking 1,000 machines on your network or even 10 machines on your network, uh, querying them, I'm just going to ask the satellite server. And uh, you know, again, because it's satellite, we have a, a extremely high confidence in what we see. However, the auditor is not going to trust satellite. They want the third party validation. Correct. Yep, so and here we have the credentials where you would set that if you were going to be doing a credential direct scan and not going through satellite. But as you can see here, we don't have anything entered, no username or password used there. And then if we head down to plugins, this is going to show us all the different type of vulnerabilities that you can uh, check the system for to see if it's compliant with any of these. If we hit this checkbox down here, we can see just the ones that we've got applied here. And for the purposes of the demo, 
the list that we're checking against is fairly short. And obviously, we didn't want to sit here and have you guys watch a scan run for a significant amount of time checking everything that was possible out there for a Red Hat system. Uh, the other thing to note are the specific settings for patch management integration. So these settings pull additional information about each one of the systems that we're checking. Uh, information like what packages are installed on it so that your auditors can get a full list of every piece of software and every version uh, installed on that system and then be able to compare it between reports. So if you pull a, a report on a system uh, prior to an update and then after the update, you can compare those two and see what's different between them. It also pulls information on whether or not any updates are scheduled for that system. So as it's checking the system, it can also query satellite to see if there are updates scheduled inside of it that are going to be applied to it later. It gives the auditor a bit of situational awareness to know that maybe the scan that he's pulling right now won't be accurate in 30 minutes to an hour away from now when this next update is applied that the system administrator already has, already has scheduled. And he doesn't have, a, have to have access directly into satellite to be able to see that. On the preferences side here is where we actually enable this integration in with satellite. So we just scroll down here and hit the patch management section for RHN satellite. All you have to do is give it a username and password that has access to the systems that you're trying to audit. Obviously, if the user inside of uh, satellite doesn't have access to see those systems in general, uh, Nessus won't be able to pull any information about that. And that's, that's really the, the, the hook or the key with regards to knowing that, OK, this is where the API is, is being called, right? And based on the authentication, that XML RPC command requires the authenticate as a user that has purview over the systems in RHN satellite. Yep. So. so once we've got the policy outline, we can head over to scans and create a new one of those. Uh, we've already got one created. I'll just show you what it is real quick. It's pretty straightforward. All it really does is reference out to the policy that you just created and then tells it what systems you want to hold accountable to that policy. Uh, this one's actually created as a template. And doing so makes it easy to launch this again and again, rather than having to generate a new scan each time and tell it the IPs you want. You just make this one hit the launch button and kick it off to start a new one. Uh, and that one we ran a minute ago when we first logged in. So we've already got the report back out of it. We can go into the report here, be able to see a vulnerability summary that talks about everything that was scanned during that scan. So this isn't specific to any one host, it's all of them. Uh, we can see information on any one of these findings. If we hit one of these, we'll get additional drop-downs that show us which hosts actually have this vulnerability applicable to them. And then the important thing here is all the information that we get about that finding. We get information on what the security issue actually is, uh, and then also links out to our information on Red Hat site to be able to link that back to Bugzilla's to really track down more information. And this speaks to the integration here and the teamwork between the two companies is knowledge of what package revisions need to be on that system. So it knows that in order for a system to be compliant with this RHSA and all the CVEs associated with this RHSA, it needs to have this specific version of Postfix. So it doesn't just look out to what MITRE is saying needs to be the, the most recent revision of uh, Postfix. It actually references the RHSA so that it knows due to our backporting exactly what version you're going to need on the Red Hat system. So we can close this out and head over uh, to uh, Satellite. And what we're going to go through here is basically uh, kind of a workflow, right? Your auditors are going to come in. They're going to run an audit like this. They're then going to send that over to your system administrators, tell them the issue they've found. And then your system administrators are going to have to deal with that, report back to the auditors, and get another scan run. So we're going to go over to uh, Satellite now, log in here. I was hoping we were going to log in there. <laughs> There we go. That looks better. Yeah. Uh, so we'll head over to the Systems tab and verify uh, that we do have errata appending against all of these systems and be able to look and make sure that the stuff we got out of the report is actually accurate. Uh, inside a satellite, once you get to this view, uh, you can see the number of errata that are applicable to each system and the number of packages that are associated with that. I don't know if you guys can see this. Is that better? All right. Uh, so for any one of these, we can click on the package list or the errata list here and be able to see exactly which errata uh, we're talking about that are applicable to this system. Be able to check the box here and hit apply errata to patch all of those for that one specific system. Or we can then go into any one of those errata directly, be able to see information about that errata. You'll notice this looks uh, a lot similar to what you're going to see inside of the Nessus interface. Uh, and then see what packages are associated with that that will get installed on the system if you patch against it. And then which systems are affected by that. And again, on this, you can hit select all here and do an apply errata to be able to patch that across all the systems that have that single errata applicable to it. 
And why, why this is significant is that one of the, the main questions that comes up with customers as we're out there on the field is, well, I'm getting these errata from Red Hat, which ones do I apply? Um, it becomes problematic because you have to devise a mechanism then to de define w w whether you need an enhancement, whether you need a bug fix, or whether you need a critical patch, and coming up with a strategy for that. Um, having something like Nessus tell you that these are in fact the things that you want to fix so that you can pass your audit then and correlating those packages or backporting them against uh, what it is that you see, you can see that this one's actually an enhancement, right? And so it's just not an enhancement for the sake of being an enhancement, it's actually a critical type of uh, patch that you need so that you can achieve compliance. And so that correlation again is, is critical. One, one thing to go back to your Venn diagram too is, yeah. you know, what do I patch? So I'm curmudgeonly old security guy, patch everything, right? Everything's on a 72 hour patch cycle, right? We give ourselves 72 hours to get every, no, we don't, okay. Um, so back out, here in, the, out <laughs> here in the real world, um, we do things, we do regression testing, we do what we have to do, but when the auditor is coming at, into quarter, and you look at that Venn diagram, and you look at those machines that are, he's going to, or she's gonna audit, you know, that's, that's one category of threat. It's a different category of threat than the analysis of the, you know, this postfix server is facing the internet, right. that's a different one. But let's be honest, if uh, we're somewhere where we get audited, uh, that's a threat. <laughs> right. The folks with the clipboards are a real threat. Right. <laughs> And so as he was talking to the, the difference between uh, enhancements and security findings, we can get all that information also. If we go over and hit the errata tab up here, we'll see every errata that was uh, found inside of the systems that are being managed by satellite uh, with different types shown for each one of them. And the different tabs here if we want to see just those. So in this example, there's only six, so it's a pretty small number to deal with. But if you were managing, say, you know, several thousand systems, you might open up your errata page and have a decent number of, of uh, different errata that are going to be showing up kind of harder to parse through it that way. So we separated it out to show bug fixes here that are specific to bugs that have been identified that aren't security related, maybe just a functionality thing. Uh, enhancements here for getting additional functionality inside of the packages. And then uh, the really important ones, the security errata here, that then link back out to CVEs to give you additional information about any of those. So for the purposes of the scan, we want to just make the auditors happy because he's right, they are a threat. Uh, so we'll go over to our systems tab and what we want to do is be able to build a system set. So we want a set of uh, errata that we're going to patch against rather than doing one or two at a time. So we'll hit the system set manager here and then head to the schedule errata updates. So this is going to pull down a list of all the errata that we have applicable to the systems that we're managing and allow us to either select them all or go through and cherry pick which ones we want to patch against. Once we have that selected, we just hit apply errata here and Satellite's going to come back and ask us when we want to do that. Do we want to schedule it as soon as possible? Do we want to schedule it for 2 a.m. a week from now? How do we want to do that? Uh, for the purposes of the demo here, we're going to schedule it as soon as possible. And normally you have about a 15 to 30 minute cycle before the systems are going to check back in the Satellite and see that they have a job pending that they need to push an update to their local stuff. At that point, they'll reach out to Satellite, pull down the new updates, and install it. In the demo, I've got a cron job running that's running every minute, talking back to satellite on those systems that we're working with and checking to see if there's anything new that it needs to grab. So we've got that uh, applied in there and scheduled. And we can head over to the schedule tab and see uh, those pending errata that we need to push out and when we are scheduled to do it and the systems affected therein. Uh, while that's actually running, I'm going to head back over to Nessus here real quick and kick this scan off one more time. So I want you guys to see some of the integration that comes in uh, into the plugins that these guys have enabled inside of Nessus to be able to pull information out of satellite with regard to the schedules that we're running. So it has knowledge of, of what's happening on the systems and, uh, and what has already happened, what is about to happen, and then what the current state is now. What's that? Uh, the command is RHN check. Uh, so that just has it check back out to the to the RHN server, and that's the same and, thing that it runs all the time. And there's, uh, on, anyway. there's some additional functionality too. If uh, have you played with OSAD at all and tried to install the OSAD plugin, because the OSAD plugin will will also let you do uh, the immediate pushouts as well if you enable that, and you don't have to deal with the cron job. But yeah, and so we'll see. Uh, the, the actions that are pending and scheduled inside of here, 
uh, as they're running will get lesser and lesser as they're going through. Let's go over and see if the scan's finished. All right, so that scan finished running. Uh, this is the, the latest scan here, taken at 1020. So we'll look at that one. And this is going to be right in the middle of as these patches are being pushed out to the systems, right? Uh, so you're still going to see most of the findings are still here. Uh, a couple of them may be gone away. The important thing here is to be able to look at the integration that's coming in from Nessus. So for each one of these systems, we get a full dump of all the packages that are loaded on that box. And you'll see different packages for different types of systems. The web servers here versus the workstation here uh, versus the DNS servers up here. Additionally, for any one of those, we'll be able to see uh, standard information along the lines of what kernel version they're running, uh, when the last uptime was of the system, when the last reboot was, uh, information like that. And then this line here is going to give us data on how many pending updates we have for this one system. So it's a little hard to read there, but this system has two updates pending for it. We can see the web servers have four, and then the workstation has one that's pending against it. So if an auditor is running an audit against your system, sees that there's findings pending against it, they can also go in here and look and see, okay, well, there are updates that are coming for the system. Maybe I should talk to the, whoever the system owner is, see when that update is going to be applied, and then rescan the box after that. So we head back over to satellite and see if these schedules are done yet. And so everything's been applied. If we go and look in our systems tab as a system administrator, we should see all the systems are showing green, everything's showing that it's up. Uh, so now we can report back to our auditors and let them know all the systems are done. You should be able to rerun your scan and get a final clean scan on those systems. <clears throat> but before we do that, I want to throw a little monkey wrench into it. Uh, so kind of to replicate what it would be like if you were scanning a facility that was uh, somewhere you necessarily weren't next to and didn't know if you could always get to. So imagine that if, uh, you know, let's say the, the primary DNS and web servers that we have here had to go offline for some reason, facility maintenance. Uh, we're going to log into each one of those and power them off. So we're turning off the primary web server there, and then we'll turn off DNS one here. And we got a little check running over here just to see when these start failing. So we see that web one's failed now. It's not responding to the ping test. And then uh, NS1 will probably do the same thing here momentarily. So now that we know both of those two systems are off, we're still going to let our auditor go ahead with his job. It's his job is scanning these systems, accessing the vulnerabilities. We're not going to stand in his way and try to stop him. So we'll go ahead and launch that. And again, what it's doing, not talking directly to the systems. There's no credentials on it. So it's going to communicate out to satellite, ask satellite what the status of everything is, and then pull that back into the report that we're going to have at the end, which will hopefully be a clean system report. One thing to note here, it gives you status on how many systems it's scanning and if it's done you know, three or five or any of those. Right now, it's still pulling information down from satellite to be able to generate the reports. While it's doing that, though, you can head over to the report tab, see that it's running, and any information that it has gathered so far, you can go ahead and access, which at this point is just the patch management information on the system. Yeah. If, if you hit the, uh, if you go back to that, if you would um, hit the host summary up top next to vulnerability summary, It'll like, so in this scan, it's not that important, but if you've got a big scan going, this will tell you which machines are where. You know, if you're, if you're really worried about that web server that the auditor's beating you up about, but the rest of them are to, to cover your backside, oh, that one's done, click, and you can see that information. Mm -hmm. so. uh, thank you for pointing that out, too. I meant to show you guys earlier. When you're looking at uh, reports that you pull, like the first one we got today, you can go into the host summary section of that and be able to get a graphical view of how many uh, vulnerabilities are on each system and what severity those vulnerabilities are going to be. So for the one that we're running now, which looks like it just completed, we should be able to go into, see that there's nothing pending in the vulnerability summary, and then uh, uh, specifics on each one of the hosts to show that all of the hosts are now patched. You could go into any one of these hosts if you wanted to, uh, pull the additional information from it on uh, the number of, or the, the list of packages that is in here, so that if your security auditors wanted to know, you know, what packages did you upgrade to get rid of the findings that were on the system, they can pull that information from here and be able to compare them between the two. So again, the, the two big things that I see with it, guys, being able to audit systems without having credentials to it and being able to audit systems that may be offline uh, when you're trying to run your vulnerability assessment. There you go. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Cool stuff. Questions? Yes. Yeah, we use the, the regular admin user that's created inside of uh, satellites, kind of like the global user that can see everything. But you could create a specific user for a group of systems if you wanted uh, your Nessus security tool to only be able to see those systems. 
uh, when it authenticates against the Nessus or it authenticates against the satellite server, it's only going to be able to see those systems that it has access to. And there's some strategies around that. The, the question came up last year as well, um, and uh, even taking a look at just your PCI DSS-based systems or uh, the ones that are being audited and putting them into another organization because satellite supports multiple organizations is a strategy that you could use. At that point, the administrator that would be against that administration would only have purview over those systems. And at that point, Nessus would do the same thing because it's authenticating against that user. That user is inside an organization, and they can only see those specific systems underneath it. So. Yep. Could you hear that? I couldn't yeah. quite make it out. The, the question was with auto errata being turned on. Is that correct? OK. And, and uh, what happens is that you go through and apply it, and then it takes days. How many systems are we talking about, first of all? 15 systems. Hmm. That's, That's a hmm. That, cre cre <laughs> what's the ticket number associated with that one? <laughs> that, is, <clears throat> that is definitely not the way that it should be. I mean, no. they should be checking in pretty frequently with the satellite server. Oh, uh, there is uh, something that, I, that has come to mind. The RHNSD. Uh, yeah, is that daemon running? The daemon running. And if not, you need to enable that as a client on the systems because the remote execution commands may not be working for you. Do you so do you know if that is or is not enabled? OK, yeah, that, that, would, that would definitely that would do it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that's the daemon that checks in periodically with us and lets us know what's going on. That also will provide updates. Uh, and one thing we didn't do in this, because we were providing the updates through the satellite interface, if you were to go on a system locally and apply patches directly on it, uh, that would also get reported back to satellite the next time that the system checked in with RHNSD. I think, I think it's called RHNCFG-actions is the, is the package that you need for remote execution commands. Mm -hmm. and then it starts working. At least off the top of my head, I, that's what I remember. Um, there's a question back there. Yes. Yeah, um, it will need credentials to log into those devices. So obviously, if satellite doesn't know, it can't tell you. And those um, those can be, you know, key exchange. It can be privilege escalation if you don't allow root, you know, hopefully directly. But yeah, you can certainly scan. Um, and depending on your environment, um, you can use an audit file. That, that we have some pre-built audit files. Depending on what you're auditing against, you can write your own audit files. Uh, you know, on the, the repeatable, one of the things we recommend but doesn't get a lot of, if you are, for example, worried about PCI and HIPAA, you can take the two audit files, which are human readable text, merge the two of them, and run that one regularly, and then run the PCI specific one before the auditor comes, run the HIPAA specific one before you do that audit. So that, that you can do with Nessus or with Security Center. With Security Center, it's a little easier if you're in a larger environment because we can manage lots of credentials and lots of policies and do the reporting. But either way, we can, we can talk to anything that's out there and um, run on whatever platform you're running. Was there something specific that Well, if there's follow-up questions. Yep, what, sure. Uh, what other operating systems do you guys uh, cover? For scanning or for running the scanner on? For scanning for PCI client. Uh, <laughs> for PCI, uh, anything that you're likely to have in PCI scope. So Windows, Macintosh, uh, most flavors of Linux. We have scans. I don't think we have PCI-specific scans for you know, i-series, AS, you know, legacy stuff. Cisco, Cisco devices, correct. We have the ability to scan Cisco, uh, Cisco iOS, real iOS, not the stuff that we carry in our pockets. Um, June OS, uh, we can you know, do, do a lot of things. It does database. There are a lot of things. If you want, I'll give you a card and ping in, get you hooked up with an eval or something. But, it can talk to a lot of things. It can run on a lot of systems as well. So whatever, whatever OS you're running, uh, we can probably run on. Um, I'm actually quite interested in the, the crowd that we have here with regards to the type of compliance that you're actually trying to uh, deal with. Uh, most of the crowd, PCI DSS. And if I could get a okay, PCI DSS back there. OK, good number of people. And then HIPAA. OK, wow. That's, that number is increasing yearly, I, I notice. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the same hands, too. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Uh, <laughs> Stig. 
Yep. Okay, one. What the heck? We gotta send more government people, guys. <laughs> more government people? Uh, Sarbanes Oxley. <laughs> three of us. <laughs> oh, look at all the Sarbanes pop. Yeah. yeah, that's the one, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so we'd like some feedback every year. We kind of go through this, and um, I think next year it's going to be a little bit broader, uh, including some of the NASA stuff. We're thinking of actually expanding into some of the I identity management components as well. Um, but you know, what are you, what are you folks interested in? Did you find the, uh, the 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 presentation useful? Was there something that you were looking for that you didn't know about? Is there anything else you want to see now? Yeah, we got time. Yes. Uh, so yeah, under the the configuration channels here, you can go in and, and specify a specific uh, channel that you'd like to create, and then you basically add configuration files into it. Uh, so you generate the files that you want, put it in there, and then subscribe systems to those configuration channels, and then they will automatically get all the files that are in that channel, and it will maintain them. So if someone comes on, changes it, the next time RHNSD checks in, it'll it'll put it back. Unless it were a configuration file that was associated with a, with, an, a with, security with audit. A, with a known vulnerability with a patch. So if there's a RHSA, if there's a bulletin on it, then um, you know, we're going we're gonna to address that. Right. If not, we don't know about it. And However, it, depending on how that looks on the system, uh, we might be able to uh, audit for that configuration. Although that, that with a depends. custom, yeah, with a custom, with, with, with custom audit. Well, and then there's also yeah. there's audit policies that come out for um, uh, from the guys over yeah, at Tenable so, so for we, different security policies. We generate policies. audit policies. You can generate your. We generate audit policies. We have a machine, you know, an application that does the the DoD stuff that you know takes the blob they give you and turns it into something we can deal with and fires them back out. But we also have standards from you know NIST and Cisco's policies or recommended policies and uh, IBM's I series recommended security policies. So we have a lot of audit policies, and that's where we get into the the different types of audit, you know, there's and compliance. There's externally imposed compliance right. and internally. And so compliance, we all kind of sneer at because it's a pain for us. But, you know, the I want our systems built this way uh, because that's what works in our environment is compliance too. So we can tune or you can write clean uh, policies to match that. Was your question and, more related to like IDS intrusion detection? What happens if a configuration file changes? that? Okay. Yep. <coughs> right. All right. So uh, a lot of the implementations that I see in, in at least in the DoD space uh, for satellite will have um, templating done for Kickstart files. So right. there's a templating engine built inside a satellite that allows you to basically, uh, through the GUI, be able to draw out what you want a system to look like when you initially build it, at least from a package and general configuration standpoint, and then. Uh, Usually, they'll start kicking in more and more configuration files inside of that that are specific to their environment. Um, one project that Akash and I are both also working on is, is called Aqueduct, which is uh, basically an open source project that has a bunch of contributors from systems integrators to a couple guys at Red Hat, uh, and then some government people that are working on it as well, that basically automates the process of uh, getting a system in compliance with PCI or STIG or HIPAA compliancy or any of that. Uh, so what I've been seeing more in mind is that they're using Aqueduct to handle uh, the automation of the security configuration directly, and then using configuration channels for things that are specific to the site. You know, maybe an Etsy password file or, or, or some right. other configuration that they have, uh, or maybe you know they're running a bank of DNS servers and they have their all their DNS server files are held inside of configuration channels. Because if you get into to trying to do all of the compliance and configuration channels, that's a lot of files that you'd have to be managing inside of that one place. And the nice thing is, if you need to change it everywhere, you only change it once. But doing that initial uh, build of all of those can be tedious. Could you flip back to the slide deck? I just want to show one thing quickly. And I think there was another question. Yeah. They're already in there. If you're updating, they've been in there for months. Um, so just very quickly, if you advance through a couple of, right, we have a couple of screenshots. Sure. If, so for the, the DOD folks and anybody that's using Security Center, Security Center is the central management tool. It's the, it's the console we interact with for all of Tenable's enterprise pieces, starting with Nessus. Just if we quickly zip through. That policy creation looks pretty much the same. 
policy creation uh, looks pretty much the same. We go through the same things, we go again. Uh, and here's where it gets interesting. So the results look very similar. But one of the things that we do in Security Center is we keep track because every scan is not a separate file. If you look in the bottom, I show that uh, on one of the previous examples when Lee and I were working, uh, he found a Firefox vulnerability that's shown in that top one. In a later scan, it wasn't there anymore. So if you looked at the later scan, all you saw was the green. But down there in the bottom, I highlighted, we actually show you the ones in Security Center that have been mitigated. So we can actually say yet another way to, to bring that up. But that requires the, the database back in to keep tabs across them. So it, it looks pretty much the same. You run through it all. But when you go looking through results up on the top, you say all new or mitigated. And we can, you know, if the auditor wants to see it, don't, here, here's what got fixed and when. That's nice. It does the delta for you. Then yes. you don't have to do the manual comparison. You don't have to do the compares. Fixed. And are we doing on time? Where are we? I think we're right at time. It's yeah. uh, 1048 now. Right. So Great. anybody have any other questions? Out, so. And if you do, you, you're free to you know yeah. come up to us, and we'll be happy to answer them. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon me to let you know oh, yes. at this <laughs> point that uh, the Summit Cup game check-in code for this session is 1956.